Welcome to the stage, Mr. David Roberts. Welcome, everybody. It's my job to uh, make you feel comfortable and welcome here today. Um, I know for some of you, this might be the first luncheon. For some of you, this is actually maybe the first time in Indiana. Uh, so welcome. Welcome both. Um, we do this uh, pretty much every Tuesday. So you're welcome to come back anytime. Um, no, this is a lovely event center, and we've been here for the last couple years. We're, we're grateful to be back again, and I'm um, grateful to have so many folks with us. So thank you for coming. Um, it's also my job, oh my gosh, the, that picture is uh, definitely before I started working at the BIC. Um, no, I didn't, <laughs> less gray hair at that time. Um, and Les Alexander had hair when, when he started just a few months ago. So, um, but my job is really to take you through the last 10 years, uh, plus a few, um, and you'll see what I mean here, as to how the BIC came to be. We're, we're celebrating 10 years of operation, but that doesn't mean it's 10 years of existence or 10 years of planning. Um, the story of batteries in Indiana actually goes back a very long time. We started here in the 90s, and by the way, I do my own slides, so if it's, you'll, you'll recognize that these are uh, definitely not done by a professional. Um, but, but the story of batteries goes back really to the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, and the work that GM was doing here in Indiana. Um, a guy named Bill Wylam was known as Battery Bill back in the day, and I think there's probably a couple people in, in the crowd now that were young engineers um, that were two or three rungs underneath um, Bill and, and his team. Um, but his team, including folks, um, you might know Bob Gallion and uh, John Waters and others worked on the EV1 project that was part of the Delco Remi, Delco Electronics um, projects back in the day under GM's leadership. Um, that transmit, or that uh, powertrain and the batteries were built in Northeast Indianapolis, uh, in Castleton at a facility um, that is still there today. It's very uh, close to the Roche campus for those of you that are, that are in the Fishers area, in the Castleton area. Um, but a lot of history has, uh, has transpired that built what, what we used to call, or what we call battery bloodlines. Um, during my time at the IEDC, this is how we would introduce the topic of why batteries and why Indiana. Um, folks often would think about Bay Area uh, maybe Austin, Texas, UT uh, Austin did a lot of work early on, or, or University of Michigan. But this is really going back historically into our history. Then you see in the 2000s, BAE Systems, Allison Transmissions started developing hybrid uh, drivetrains for buses. Cummins was working in that space. Interdell, Alter Nano, uh, companies like Bright Automotive were in the ecosystem. And then you see Energy Systems Network uh, launching in 2009. This is an important event because uh, under Paul Mitchell's uh, leadership at Energy Systems Network, we saw a lot of interesting projects being launched out of that uh, public-private partnership, one of them being the Battery Innovation Center, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then you see in the 2010s, um, leading into the decision to launch the Battery Innovation Center, a lot of other companies and activity. All right, so the next one's an eye chart. This is a um, memo that was written in October of 2010 that outlined the entire need and the urgency uh, for something that would eventually be called the Battery Innovation Center. And what's not pictured on here are about six or seven more pages of content and business plan. And I had the opportunity to review that in preparation for today. And it's really amazing because as you read through it, you see principles of national security, of securing a robust battery supply chain in North America, supporting not just the uh, automotive and mobility markets, but the energy storage systems um, in the stationary context. And it reinforced to me that there is um, no, no shortage of need today. And if anything, it's um, even more of a present need for the resources that Battery Innovation Center brings to the ecosystem in, in where we are today. Perhaps even more so given where uh, foreign competition has gone since the 2010 era, and um, you know, in some ways, the United States is playing catch up in some ways. So here in 2010, there was a um, December meeting. Uh, Vic Lechtenberg from Purdue University, Paul Mitchell mentioned John Waters, and Kyle Werner from, um, from Crane. And so you can see very early on Crane's influence 
in uh, the planning and the scoping of uh, what became the Battery Innovation Center. You can see our, our coloring changed uh, a little bit, but the logo has <laughs> remained uh, very much the same. There was a planning session for a couple days, and what came out of it was unified support for something like this, um, like this uh, thing that has become Battery Innovation Center. Um, as you look along, you're, you'll be grateful that graphics have changed over the last 12 year period and have become much easier to read. Um, but you can see we had the general outline for the BIC capabilities. And what became upper left hand corner, you can see Keystone Group did a great rendering of the facility and it's essentially what we uh, have now that's been in operation for the last 10 years. You'll see a beautiful entryway. Those polished floors are now consumed with a lot of equipment and a lot of activity. You'll see in the lower right-hand corner, um, that's a submarine string of VLRA batteries. Um, so again, that, that close nexus with um, Crane has been seen throughout. And I'll just pause here and say the people piece has been really important. Um, one of the things that makes Battery Innovation Center so special are the folks that have come and been a part of the team and then graduated out and had opportunities to move on to other areas, uh, generally speaking, within the industry, areas of impact in different companies. Um, and it's just been really rewarding to see the alumni network grow uh, from the Battery Innovation Center. Um, the leadership has been the right people at the right time for the right need. Um, the original executive director and CEO, uh, Captain Chuck Lasota, came off base. He was technical director, um, was just the right person to help uh, galvanize the vision for the Battery Innovation Center and help launch uh, the project. Uh, he passed away suddenly, unexpectedly, in 2014 at the end of the year. In 2015, uh, I was asked to come and help lead as the CEO for a while. About a month later, I recruited Ben Reitzman to come with me. Um, we had been working together at Interdell. And uh, in 2017, um, I had the opportunity to join the state and Ben took over as the CEO. During that period, we were able to pivot from, let's call it a 99% a, a DOD focus into a much larger percentage of a commercial focus and serve the industry at large. Um, and Ben really grew that opportunity then, um, that early pivot and uh, brought us to a position now where the team has been able to support um, well over 400, uh, potentially approaching 500 different companies over the course of, of time. Um, and so then, um, Les Alexander had the opportunity to join us as a CEO um, in October of last year, and Les um, brings a great background of both commercial and DOD. Um, he was a Naval Procurement Officer, so he understands that world much better, uh, I think, than I do or the rest of the board and it's just um, nothing but uh, broader opportunities and expanded footprint uh, moving forward, and he'll, he'll share some of that vision as well. Um, I couldn't do this um, without, we, none of us could do this without the support of a great board. From early on, we had representation from the community. Uh, folks from an organization called Radius um, were involved. Originally, Lieutenant Governor Becky Skillman uh, was on the board, um, then transitioned into Jeff Quile and others over the course of time. Green County has been phenomenal in terms of uh, financial support. Um, the board has also enjoyed some, um, some industry folks over the course of time. And then two board members that have maintained uh, consistency throughout would be Paul Mitchell, I mentioned him earlier, and Chad Pittman, who can't be with us uh, today. He's um, deployed serving our country. So it's, it's fantastic to serve um, the community. As a nonprofit, we, we don't have shareholders. We, we answer to the public at large. Um, and so that's really been a great liberty and freedom that we've had um, to advance the industry the right way at the right time. So here's just a couple of notes. Uh, again, a little bit of an eye chart, but this is all good news. If you can't read it, it's all good news. Um, where do we stand today? Um, it's really on, again, the precipice of this huge opportunity being magnified. Um, you'll see some of the headlines on the right-hand side. Atios, we're uh, grateful that they chose to incubate at the Battery Innovation Center after coming through an accelerator program with Heritage Group, uh, a local organization that brought them into the state from UC San Diego. You see some really big gaudy numbers being announced, um, like NTEC, 1.5 billion separator facility in Terre Haute. Um, we talked about the Stellantis uh, and Samsung SDI investment in Kokomo. Samsung SDI and GM up in New Carlisle, massive numbers 
around facilities um, that total over $5.5 billion of uh, battery manufacturing investment. Um, there's just been a, a tremendous run. Toyota, I think just last week, it was announced um, that they had uh, another $1.4 billion that they're investing in their Princeton, Indiana facility. So um, we are grateful at Battery Innovation Center to have played a small role in continuing that battery bloodline, that battery tradition uh, here in Indiana. And, and again, nothing but great things ahead. The last point um, that I'll make is the last point on the slide that Bic announced we're going to expand a pilot line uh, activity into Indianapolis. If you think about it, um, buttressing the capabilities in, um, in Westgate, that's really the intention, where Westgate will continue uh, to really be the TRL one, two, three, early stage validation, the test and evaluation of those early stage technologies. And then there's a facility that's not too far from here, five minutes away, called Emerging Manufacturing Collaboration Center, where you'll think about how do you get ready for production, that next valley of death um, in TRL 456, um, and really helping folks at larger scale uh, production viability. Um, Les can tell you more details, but the expectation is that'll come online early next year. We've got some exciting partnerships to announce actually today. So with that, thank you very much. I'm gonna introduce Les Alexander. As I mentioned, Les is a uh, uh, former Naval Procurement Officer. He's been in the battery in industry for over 20 years um, with uh, companies like A123 and Navitas before we were able to recruit him to lead the Battery Innovation Center. So please help me in welcoming Les Alexander. Welcome to the Battery Innovations Annual Luncheon. As Dave just so elegantly stated, the BIC is celebrating 10 years of service. As the newly appointed CEO, I have the pleasure of following Chuck Lasota, Dave Roberts, and Bill, Ben Reisman as the past Chief Executive Officer of the BIC. So thank you for this honor. First, let me recognize our guests. I believe from Senator Young's office, we have Greg Good. Uh, is he present or here, um, from the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, Mr. David Watkins. Um, we also would like to recognize John Thompson from the IEDC board. Um, those are all members that have supported us as we move forward. And then we have representatives from Green County, uh, Brianne Geralds and Ariel Shelton. And a special shout out to our ARI contingents, Brooke Pine, and from the Naval Surface Warfare Center, we have uh, Nova Carden. So thank you for coming. And then a special thanks to our panelists um, and our booth sponsors, Photo Automation, uh, the Indy Autonomous Challenge, Volta Foundation, Biderat, of course the BIC, Ateos Systems, um, Energy Systems Network, ESN, Flexware, Devaro, JBC Technologies, Glassboard, um, and Six Feet Up. Thank you so much for supporting us in our booth space. And to our panelists, thank you so much for your time and make yourself available to make this day so special. Um, I also would like to recognize our most recent CEO, Ben Reisman. Ben did an excellent job of moving the Battery Innovation Center forward. He constructed three major focus areas, cell fabrication, battery tests and evaluation, and our education and training area. So please give Ben a round of applause. And as Dave mentioned and recognized our board, of course, Mr. Dave Roberts, everybody knows Dave, Paul Mitchell, and Chad Pittman, who was deployed in Taiwan. And finally, to our big staff, I am so proud of our team, and, an, and we have a number of new members. So I like to say, all the big uh, team, please stand so people can be recognized. So in honor of uh, our first CEO, Captain Charles Lasota, each of you at your table 
If you can open up, you have a coin inside. It's a challenge coin. So when the book, the big first opened 10 years ago, there was a commissioning coin given out as a gift. I, Gary Parker from Cummins showed me and Dave the coin, and we thought it would be nice to honor our 10 years with a new coin. In the Navy, I know not just in the Navy, but since I was a Naval officer, I will start with in the Navy. Um, each person is issued a coin, and it shows the traditions of people that are on ships, a boat if you're a submariner, a command, an outfit, or a specialty unit would memorialize their presence with a coin. A coin will be awarded to remind members they are part of something special. In naval tradition, members would carry their coin around, and if it was rendered, a fellow member may ask you to produce your coin. If you could not produce your coin, you would have to buy a round of drinks. If you did have your coin, then the challenger had to buy the round of drinks. So we're not going to do this here. Everybody is having lunch. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you have this coin as a symbol of, our, of your support of the Battery Innovation Center. So on the front of the coin, it has the big emblem and the number of years of service. On the back, it has the Indiana seal and a picture of the building that um, Dave has shown you. And then 10 years and then it has a shout out to our affiliation with Applied Research Institute. So please enjoy the coin. But if I ask you to produce your coin, make sure you have it. If not, you owe me a drink. So 10 years, the BIC has served over 400 customers and we continue to perform this mission. For myself, I am honored to serve their battery and energy storage community. For the last 25 years, I work for a number of companies in research and development, operations, business development to produce technologies that would change the world. And while in the fight, it does not feel like the world is changing, but coming to the BIC, I now see that the world has changed. While writing my talking points, I was sitting in my car at a recharging station. That was so different than 25 years ago. Almost 20 years ago, I was sitting in front of the Army with a vial of black powder, and it was lithium iron phosphate. And I was trying to convince the Army that this was going to be a battery one day. Now, I didn't even believe it, but I was trying to convince the Army and make them believe it. And now we use lithium iron phosphate as one of the uh, co most common battery chemistries. Just five years ago, we were working on a Sonoboy battery for Lockheed, and now that's actually in production. So things are changing. Um, I know this is part of my story, and each of you, you have your own story. Um, but my message is things are actually changing. So what will the next chapter of the Battery Innovation Center be? The next chapter of the bill will build upon the foundation that's already created for the last 10 years, an opportunity to increase the impact of the Battery Innovation um, Center already has, to collaborate on new battery cell or systems to improve manufacturing processes, to test uh, batteries for cars or trains or planes, or perhaps just a run-of-the-mill military weapon system. How about training for 3,000 new Indiana employees? What do I know the BIC will do? We will continue to serve and collaborate with companies. We are open to collaborate uh, on a number of opportunities with the state of Indiana support. We have incubation both here in Indianapolis and down south in Newberry. We will continue to provide test and evaluation services for customers. Our team of engineers and technicians are prepared and capable to evaluate new energy storage systems. The BIC will continue to build out educational services. We will continue to work with our fine institutions uh, uh, that Indiana provides. Ivy Tech, Vincennes University, Indiana, and Purdue. We'll be launching a new battery technicians class with Vincennes, with our partner with NO Energy. Um, and Mark Vasso from NO Energy is here today. We'll be piloting our first class in June. The first 20 seats are actually free, but then we'll be announcing three other locations 
those will not be free. So make sure you get on the free side. We also will have a training announcements regarding uh, STEM education and first responders. And finally, we'll be developing uh, plant for training with our partner, Ivy Tech. And finally, we will grow. We will provide the services to meet the needs of a growing industry, the need for more research and development, and the need for more aggressive manufacturing improvements. This is what the future looks like for the Battery Innovation Center. And speaking of growth, I would like to introduce Stacy Kelly, Global OEM Director for Rockwell Automation. Good morning. Thank you, Les. Um, so I'm Stacy Kelly, uh, Les, is a Global OEM Director for Rockwell Automation, focused on EV battery machine builders, primarily equipment builders. And um, for those of you who don't know, Rockwell Automation is the largest, world's largest company dedicated to industrial automation and digital transformation solutions, based out of Milwaukee, not far from here. $9 billion um, in revenue, 26,000 employees, present in over 100 countries and six continents. So we're excited to announce today that we are partnering with the BIC to expand their state-of-the-art um, plans for this facility and, um, and also Savima on the battery cell assembly technology. And what we're looking to bring is you know, our kind of latest and greatest industrial automation technology as well as the um, digital twin capabilities that we have based on an acquisition we made about uh, five years ago, which brings um, virtual training tools for the machine and the operations, but also we have augmented reality solutions for the digital workforce expansion tied to kind of key operation and maintenance procedures to kind of accelerate that new learning with our um, yeah, with our you know next generation employees coming into the, the workforce. So um, with that, um, and, and, and then beyond that, I guess you know we can look at other opportunities as well. But thank you to to Les, um, David, and the entire team at BIC for giving us this opportunity. We're excited and honored to be a part of your future. At the EMC Squared building, um, we are expanding into the space. Currently, you'll see the rendering on the screen there. This is our, our first look at what the new space looks like. And um, we'll be adding some coding operation. Intersys will be adding some coding on the left side. Um, this is our wet lab area that we would have. Um, and then we'll adding some cell capability. Um, we, our plans is to have this up and running and commissioning. This will be the coding line that Intersys will install, and then next. And then finally, this is the area where Rockwell is partnering with us to have cell assembly. So the, the purpose of that line, as Dave said, is to move into that technology readiness level four through six, where we can help companies actually manufacture their cells and get it ready for full qualification or to develop prototypes. Um, this is a necessary part in the industry throughout the United States. There's not many places where people can actually commercialize their cells and move it into commercialization. So this is the next phase of the growth of the BIC. Um, it does not take away from our R&D center, which focuses on TR level one through three down in Newberry. This is complementary to this service, and we will maintain both locations. So we're hopefully that we have a broader offering to the community, not only um, we will also train out of that facility so we can expand our training operation, look at smart manufacturing techniques, and provide a platform for companies to collaborate on the manufacturing side. So that is the attention of this uh, expansion into the EMC Square. So we thank you for your support. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, I was hoping this is the last time you would hear from me, but I think I got some other responsibilities. But. Um, I appreciate everybody coming and supporting me. Ben, thank you for, for coming. Um, this has been a great affair, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. I'm going to invite 
of my um, cell fab team lead, um, Dr. Amal Shandekar. And our um, test and evaluation manager, Alex Serba. And, and Alex is a Purdue grad, so, so we got some inside baseball here. So first is the Voltage Award. This award recognizes an emerging company and or technology with the highest potential to make a difference in batteries and electrification. The nominees were 24M, Ateo Systems, and Biderat. And congratulations to Ateo Systems. If Ateo will come up. And I believe we have Thea from Ateos here. Hello, everyone. I am Thea Reed. I am the COO of Ateo Systems. Thank you so much to the Battery Innovation Center team. Ateos has been incubated at the BIC for four of its 10 years, and we look forward to the future of battery innovation with the team. Thank you. The current award, this award recognizes a company with the fielded with fielded technology whose magnitude is amplifying and sustaining the industry today. And the nominees were Alcogen, 10.9, and Intersys. And congratulations to Alcogen. I believe Cam from Alcogen is here. Hi everyone, my name is Cam. I come from Alcogen. Um, I'm going to be on the panel, so I'll introduce myself a bit later, but thank you uh, to the BIC, Les and Amal, and Alex, and the rest of the team. They do fantastic work, and we're really excited to continue our relationship with them. So thanks, everyone. And thank you, Liz, for host where are you? Thank you for everything you did. It was a great event. Appreciate it. Leading the charge, this award is presented to an individual from the battery and energy storage industry who has directly made a difference in the industry in education, outreach, energy transition, and our community. The nominees were Mr. Todd Young, U.S. Senator for Indiana, Dr. Vilas Pohl, Purdue University, Mr. Sam Stewart, NSW Crane. Congratulations, Senator Todd Young, United States Senator. And from, I believe from, we have Greg Good from uh, Senator Young's office. I have the great privilege and pleasure of serving as state director for Todd Young and, and uh, in that capacity, it's part management of people, it's part policy, but ultimately it's about managing disappointment on the faces when people find out that the senator himself cannot be here and, and you're stuck with the state director. Senator Young's in uh, Washington, D.C. doing his job and he's working very, very hard for the Hoosier State as well as for all of you, working hard for the United States of America. And as uh, Mr. Roberts, appreciate uh, your leadership and as he's told you a little bit about the history of this uh, phenomenal organization and the efforts around collaboration with higher education and industry and the military, it's about economic and national security. It wasn't that long ago, about uh, 40, excuse me, 63 years ago, when John Kennedy stood up and had a message to the world that let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to ensure the survival and success of liberty. We were in the midst of a great global competition then, the Cold War, and today we're 
um, in the midst of a great global competition today with regimes that do not share our commitment to freedom and to liberty. And Indiana has a very important part to play in this quest for superiority in economic and national security, and we're doing it with all of you. Todd Young is your ally in this effort. He is one of the most serious, hardest working legislators in our United States Congress who will work across the political aisle in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish. And our message is to thank all of you, the leaders in this important sector, because if we want to ensure the survival and success of liberty today, on this beautiful day in the 21st century, it's about energy and it's about leadership in this important space. So thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be with you. Alex Mola with Andretti. Things go fast where they are, and we're glad that he's here uh, sharing some innovation and all that good stuff that's taking place at Andretti. Welcome to the stage, Alex. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Alex Moeller here with Andretti Global. I um, want to thank uh, the Battery Innovation Center. Congratulate you all on 10 years. That's pretty amazing. Um, but certainly thank uh, um, what Ben has built here over the years, Les, um, the team, Heather, Elizabeth, Teresa. But thanks for having me. So um, I think we all agree less is more. Um, but I think we're going to kick off with a quick video uh, about Formula E, uh, now in its 10th season, all electric open wheel series that we compete in and we've been there since the beginning. It has all the looks and feels of auto racing. But not the sounds. This is Formula E, E as in electric. Among the 11 teams competing at the Portland, Oregon E-Prix, a legendary name in auto racing, Andretti Autosports. IndyCar champion Michael Andretti is CEO. What's the attraction for you with Formula E? What attracted me to it was the new technology. You know, racing is at the forefront of the technology, so we're seeing stuff that you're probably going to see in your road cars one day. On the track this year, the Gen 3, billed as the fastest, most sustainable e-car yet. Alessandra Chiliberti is the technical manager. So do you have two motors in this car? Exactly. One. Enabling drivers to recharge the car through braking, energy now captured from all four wheels. We're not losing the energy, we're just storing that back into the battery for propelling the car. Gone are the days when they had to switch cars in the middle of the race because the battery didn't last. Now the battery goes the whole race, some 53 minutes, at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Jake Dennis drives for Andretti. Do you miss the sound of traditional racing? No, you enjoy it. You enjoy having the peace and quiet, honestly. There's no noise, no vibrations, super smooth. Uh, it, it's like a pleasure to drive one of these. You, you just hear the wind. There are no gears and ideally no pit stops. Michael Andretti took me for a ride. What should I expect? I don't know. I never drove one. Oh, I'm here. feeling so real good there. about we'll, this. We'll, we'll learn together. <laughs> I need a few more laps. <laughs> I think you did pretty well for your first time. Mm, <laughs> but there's an even more important competition going on here, the race to sustainability. And everyone from the owners to the vendors to the fans can win. Julia Paulet drives this effort. The car's electricity is generated from renewable energy. Actually, this renewable energy here is coming from uh, basically the waste cooking oils from your french fries that is turned into a biofuel that is called HVO. A sport that CEO Jeff Dodd says is also a learning opportunity for fans. They're seeing amazing racing brands, so they're seeing elite sport, but they're also seeing a platform to talk about sustainability. To drive us into the future. I thought that was a good intro for uh, our Formula E platform, again now in its 10th year. I always like to start these things by uh, a quote that I think we live by at Andretti, but everybody in this room I think uh, can understand this from Mario years ago. If everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. 
So every day we get up, we go in at Andretti Global. We have um, seven racing series, basically, where we compete globally. Um, everyone knows the IndyCar piece of our history. We're about 22 years old. Michael Andretti is the majority owner of Andretti Global, Andretti IndyCar, where we compete with three entries. Uh, current points leader, Colton Herta, by the way. We have 14 races to go this season. Um, Formula E, which is uh, very important to our success uh, in our Andretti brand globally. Um, it's now the 10th year of Formula E. Uh, we're the driver's world champions. Last year with Jake Dennis, who you saw in the video, just got through uh, an event in Monaco just weeks before the Formula One race in Monaco coming up um, on the same day as the 108th Indy 500. We're in Australia with Australia Supercars, Indy Next, which is the feeder series to IndyCar. IMSA um, have a big investment in Wayne Taylor Racing. We have a two-car GTP program with um, Acura, Honda, HRC, and then uh, Extreme E, which is going to be Extreme H, so off-road electric racing um, in climate-affected parts of the world with a male-female <clears throat> driver component. Um, and excitingly going to be extreme H in 2025. So we're going to go hydrogen racing next year. A um, bit of history of Formula E and where it, where it was and where it is now. Um, so back in 2013, uh, it was really the brainchild of Alejandro Agag and the uh, uh, former head of the FIA, Jean Tote, who is famous for leading Ferrari's world championship years with Michael Schumacher. Um, but it was time for them to jump in, um, talk about the efficiency of electric racing, you know, focus on bringing costs down if they're going to start a, a brand new racing championship that is endorsed by the FIA, you want it to survive. So key notes to focus on sustainability, the relevant technology development to lure the OEMs in has to be entertaining. Uh, these are city street circuits globally. And that was the idea, how to bring the future of electromobility to the people. Um, you had to add it. We had to add Formula E into the existing motorsport calendar, which there's you know a couple dozen racing series around the world that compete. And this was going to be on a global stage. So they actually started off the traditional calendar. They would start in November, December, and run through early spring. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, it was bringing electromobility to the people, so city street circuits all over the world. Uh, as it showed in the video, um, the first four years, the first generation of Formula E, the battery couldn't survive. Uh, they couldn't go a full race, which is about 50 to 55 minutes or so, depending on extra time. So our pit stop was actually the driver coming in halfway through the race, jumping out of the first car and finishing with the second. Um, you know, it was mandatory just because of performance. Um, it was a tough time for OEMs to really jump in because the fear was range anxiety and really jumping in to support a series where halfway through the race you, you really can't make it to the end. Um, and uh, you can tell the efficiency wasn't really there. We were traveling four race cars to every race. Uh, so the efficiencies of the platform was a bit challenging. Um, <clears throat> but they didn't want to wait. They didn't want to wait till 2018 or 2019. So they got it going. And 2014 was the inaugural season, and Andretti is now the longest serving team in the championship we've been in since day one. Um, Gen 2 came along, so that was uh, um, basically years 2017 through 2021 or so. Only one car was needed at that point. The speed was a bit better. Um, top speed here at this point is about 160 to 165. Uh, so the battery technology had advanced. It was a much lighter car. At the time, we became the BMW factory effort. You saw Mercedes jump in and Audi. Jaguar has been an OEM there for a long time. Nissan's involved, Mahindra, um, DS Automobiles, Stellantis, Maserati. Um, but the bodywork was futuristic. We wanted these to differentiate themselves in the market from a lot of the other racing series around the world, another open wheel series. Um, very highly competitive. I think there was one year we went into the final race um, where we were one of seven teams that could have won the world championship at the time. Um, and I think 18 of the 24 drivers had a chance in the final weekend. So, you know, what's interesting about Formula E, it's a spec series. Uh, it's the same chassis, it's the same battery. The battery is closed. It's really just the, the motor 
uh, the powertrain, the inverter, that's the only pieces of these cars that really can get developed. Um, so during Gen 2 for those four years, the cars are still not fast enough to really compete against F1, IndyCar, um, or Le Mans prototypes. The costs were starting to increase, even though we didn't have to travel four cars now. Um, but to try to keep up and, and keep the development going on the OEM side, those costs started to grow quite a bit. And then as you can imagine, with city street circuit events, when COVID hit, um, it was almost a miracle that the championship could continue. A lot of closed paddocks, um, closed venues, and for a series that's you know, racing in urban street centers, that was pretty surreal. But moving on from that, we're now in Gen 3. So we're getting through the second year of Generation 3 in Formula E. Um, it's the most technically advanced car so far. The weight has gone down a bit. Um, the car is capable of regenerating 40% of the energy through the race. So we start our race and we do not have enough power to finish. It has to be regenerated throughout the event. Um, it's still unpredictable. We're now a Porsche customer team. There's a Porsche factory effort and then we invest in the Porsche powertrain. They've explored doing fast charging pit stops. Um, that, that hasn't yet been adopted. There's still a lot more testing that needs to be done. Um, broadcast is up. We're approaching 400 million television viewers each season. Um, and uh, there's only more to come. We just released, and it's, it was too late for this presentation, but the Gen 3.5 car has some bodywork updates and some other things aerodynamically that should help with some top speeds. Uh, what's interesting is our tires are still treaded. We want to show the performance of EV-powered cars with regular road tires. So at some point, the transition's gonna happen here to, uh, to much bigger circuits. We're gonna move away, I think, and that you're starting to see that with our calendar, um, moving away from strictly city street circuits to actual permanent racetracks. Uh, but just came from Monaco. We go to Berlin, Germany. We're gonna go to the F1 track in Shanghai, which they just had the F1 race there a couple of weeks ago. Our current US venue is in Portland. So we race Indy cars in Portland in September, but a couple months prior, um, that's kind of a placeholder right now for Formula E until we can get back to whether it's New York City or LA or a major metropolitan area. And then our finale takes place in London. So, you know, what's to come? It's uh, Gen 3.5, Gen 4 comes up in a couple of years, just trying to go faster, longer, be more sustainable. Even in the, the tire construction, the car construction, recycled carbon fiber, things of that nature, they're exploring more cost controlled, um, improved connectivity with software, um, just maximizing battery power and efficiency, and just smarter overall. So it's an exciting place to participate, and I think the, the, real, um, the real goal for us as Andretti and the real theme is that this is a key part of our racing um, portfolio. This isn't just another series that Andretti has its name on. It was a big deal to win the world championship last year with Jake. Um, that's our goal this year. We're third in points right now with him. Um, and I just thought I'd throw in a couple of slides of how exciting that was last year to not be a factory effort, be a customer effort, and win the championship. Already had some success this year. We won a race in Riyadh and then uh, had a podium in Tokyo. The first Tokyo e Prix was just a few weeks ago. Um, but, you know, it's, it's key. It's important to understand this is not just Andretti, but it's also talent, technology, the state of Indiana is behind this effort, partnership with the IEDC, Indiana for the Bold. This is the place to be. It's a great incubator. It's a great talent hub. We love that Indiana is our home and uh, excited to be with you all today. Congrats again and thanks for having me. Dr. Penelope Jones, and she is the co-founder and CEO of Fitrat, a cutting-edge cloud platform designed for battery labs to automate their data management and analysis processes so that companies can extract critical business insights from their battery data. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Penelope Jones. So I, I am Penelope Jones. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bytrat. Um, we are 
really built with a mission to help transform the way that battery companies today are extracting value from all the data that's being generated in their labs. And really delighted today to announce a partnership, um, and you'll see, you'll see a press release coming out about this on, on Monday next week, but delighted to, to announce that we will be um, partnering with, with the BIC um, to help manage all of the, the data that's being generated in their labs. So we'll be really excited to talk to, talk to some of you um, if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, Maybe, and, and, and then before I get started, I'd also love to thank um, Les and the whole BIC team for, for partnering with us and being so forward thinking. Um, really think that the BIC is sort of moving to the next level now in terms of scale and, and all the exciting plans and just really, really excited to be, to be a part of this, um, to be a part of this journey. We were founded in 2021. Um, in the UK, uh, you may have sensed a bit of an accent. Um, we, were, we were in the physics department at the University of Cambridge, and our research was focused on building machine learning models to predict how batteries would perform under different use cases. So we were, were doing huge numbers of battery experiments and basically sending pulses into batteries and then using that, all of that data to predict how a battery would degrade under, under different use cases. And we, we had a number of publications in, in Nature and various, various um, journals. And this ultimately led to a number of really interesting um, partnerships with companies ranging from BP, BMW, um, a number of companies across, across the industry helping them to predict how their assets would degrade. And it was really interesting because the biggest commonality across all of these all of these projects was that these companies had spent like millions of dollars generating a lot of battery data that was ultimately sitting in a OneDrive on someone's um, computer and once that data had been generated the vast majority of it was never actually used to extract any meaningful value for that company and so we would we would go in kind of with these very um, what we, we thought was sort of bleeding edge um, machine learning models, and we would spend 95% of our time actually trying to find the data, clean the data, and get it into a form that we could actually do something useful with it. And, and that, was, that was kind of frustrating, honestly, but also um, we realized there's a real opportunity here for this, um, for this industry to move a lot faster and smarter if we can just build a robust data foundation um, for them to basically manage all, all of this data. So anyway, um, we ended up relocating our whole team out to Silicon Valley. Um, we are funded by some top um, venture capital firms in, in the Bay Area. And yeah, we are about to launch our, our next iteration of the platform, um, so, so very excited about that. And if, if you're working with the BIC or you're interested in sort of talking to us about that, very, very happy to do so. Um, but yeah, I, I thought what I would do now is just kind of outline some of the challenges that we've seen um, companies across the space um, face when it comes to um, data management, data analytics, and, and maybe some of you, if you've spent time in a battery lab, would have some um, familiarity with, with these challenges. So I, I think this basically gets the message across that, that, I was, that I was alluding to, which is that these companies are spending really millions of dollars each year generating a lot of battery data to answer some critical questions, ranging from how does this new material that I'm integrating into my battery impact the energy density or the cycle life or the charging time or the safety of, of the battery, all the way to a company that is not making batteries, but is, is validating batteries and, and integrating them into their product and trying to think through what is the impact of this charging algorithm on cycle life or what is the warranty of the product that is, that is reasonable. And what we basically realized is that the companies that are kind of making the fastest progress in this space have realized that through accurate, um, well thought through battery testing, they can really turn all of this data that they're generating into a competitive advantage. 
And that's really what we're on a mission to help companies to, to do. So I think when it comes Probably the biggest challenge that a company um, with a big operating, a big testing lab faces is that you might have anywhere from five to 10 to 20 different types of testing equipment in your lab. And each, I mean, I, I know there are some companies here that, that actually sell that testing, te testing equipment and it, it, it's great, but there is actually a lot of challenges with bringing all of that data into one central location. You might have cycler, um, cycler brands or manufacturing equipment, which is generating data in lots of different file formats. And to actually bring data from each part of a manufacturing line and then your formation data and your testing data into one place and actually connect the dots, it's very, very challenging and you would have to typically hire um, a whole team of software engineers or data scientists if you actually wanted to pull all of that data into one place. It especially becomes challenging as the cycle, as, as the different brands continually are upgrading their own systems. So you're having to stay on top of their upgrades to try and bring that into your own data pipeline. This is really not fun, and I, I'm speaking from experience here. Um, so usually, what a company will do as it starts to scale is it will actually. Um, like I said, maybe hire a few data scientists or software engineers to start pulling all this data together, building their own pipeline. And the challenge then becomes that as you start to scale, you really can get lots of errors, especially when it comes to the potential faults or power outages in the line. You have no way to detect this. And it just becomes really, really challenging to scale that as your company continues to grow. So usually what, what then happens is you start to realize that you're making these decisions about all this data from all the data that you're generating and critical decisions that can materially impact the product that you ship, but you don't necessarily know whether the metrics that you're receiving from the lab are actually matching to, what it, to the experiments that are being run in the lab. And that's when having a robust data pipeline really becomes like absolutely critical. Um, the other question that we start to, that we're hearing a lot from the industry is, how can we move faster, basically? Like you're having, you're, you have a certain number of experiments that you can realistically run before you need to ship your product to actually optimize the structure of the battery design or the product that you're designing. And making intelligent decisions about what experiments you're going to run becomes absolutely like critical. Um, usually, companies start to, well, we're actually seeing this trend of companies that are interested in predicting the outcome of a lot of the experiments that they're running so that they can shorten the duration of those, of those tests. And I mean, I can come back to that, but I think what, leads, what this leads really nicely onto is thinking about how to actually make use of advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence and actually pulling in all of the data that's being generated in these labs so that you can build models of how your tests are likely to kind of finish so that you can reduce the number of tests that you have to run, the duration of those tests, et cetera. And some of the companies that we're working with now are really interested in integrating machine learning models into their, um, into their planning, but also just into the entire design process. We are at this stage where we have just launched our next generation of the platform. We're really, really excited about this. Um, it is kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but it is kind of state of the art um, in terms of performance and speed. Um, we're really excited to be working with, with the BIC um, on a new partnership. And yeah, just really, really grateful to be here. And yeah, hope I can meet some of you um, after this if you're interested in, in talking more about um, how to get more, more value from your battery data. So yeah, thank you. My name is Don Wetrick. 
I want to frame why I do a panel the way I do. Um, this is probably going to be more of a conversation. They're all of, like, they're, they're okay with cutting me off, interrupting, and so are you. If there is a question, you're like, no, 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 I want some clarification. This is more of a conversation than it is a formal panel. I do not like the formality. Also, to frame this, um, I, am a, uh, I, I am a teacher of 20 several years, and one of the reasons why I'm here is um, I run a foundation that, that gets teachers to be the Trojan horses, to be the conduits of innovation in their school. I think that a lot of education is a little bit mired in the past, and so we're looking for at least one educator to be that destination. So if a local mayor, a local senator, or a local business person goes, I want to be able to know and talk to the kids and get some real things done, I want to tell them that there's some emerging things, I know who to go to. If that sounds interesting to you, and if your school does not have anybody that's working with us to start that foundation, let us know. We also run, and we're so grateful um, to be working with the IDC, we run uh, the Innovate Within pitch competition, which is, by the way, the largest high school pitch competition in the country, and it's for my state of Indiana. So um, that's why a lot of these questions will be framed the way they are. That all being said, I want to have them introduce. Chris, we'll go ahead and start with you, and we'll work our way over here of who you are and who you represent. Thanks, Don. Um, I'm Chris Mormon. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for ReElement Technologies, and we are an innovative uh, refiner of critical battery minerals as well as rare earth elements. So everything from the lithium it takes to make a battery all the way to the neodymium and presodymium it takes to make the uh, permanent magnets for a drivetrain. And uh, this will be, uh, is this our second or third time doing this, Don? I can't remember. Anyway. It'll take two or three. But happy to be back at the BIC and, uh, and have always had a lot of support from the BIC and, uh, and really appreciate what they do for the battery ecosystem here in Indiana. I'm Kevin Berry. I'm the VP of Engineering with Ateo Systems. We are a early stage startup that is incubated at the Battery Innovation Center, so that's why we're, we're here, right? But uh, our primary focus is on battery electric manufacturing. So we are working to scale up manufacturing of, of that process, right, that was originally developed by the Department of Energy. So uh, we are really, you know, while he's at maybe at the front end kind of the value chain with respect to getting the raw materials out of the, you know, for recycling or taking them out of the ground and refining them, we're more toward the, the end of the value chain where we're actually coating the electrodes or the films that go into the batteries, right? So um, at the highest level, that's who we are. Hi everyone, my name is Cam Peebles. Um, so I, I'm the, the technical manager um, in the battery group at a larger company called Alcogen. So, so Kevin's from a startup. Alcogen is about 10,000 people uh, globally. Um, and so we make uh, specialty materials that go inside the battery itself uh, and inside of a pack. And a pack in a vehicle is kind of composed of many batteries. Um, and so it's really nice to be here. Uh, excited for some good questions, so bring them on. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Richter Gary, Senior Vice President for Global Strategy and Engagement at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Um, I promise I won't say anything longer than my title today. Um, but I oversee a few different uh, portfolios at the IADC, including energy, defense, trade, our federal government affairs, uh, as well as our global government affairs. So excited to add some of that policy lens today. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, my name is Neil Banwart, and I work for Energy Systems Network, ESN, a nonprofit here in Indianapolis, uh, tied in very closely, of course, with, uh, with the Battery Innovation Center. Um, I'm also currently seconded to the Midwest Alliance for Clean Hydrogen, or Mach 2, and we're one of the seven uh, winning hydrogen hubs uh, across the country. So we'll get into that more uh, in the panel discussion, but you know, hydrogen fuel cell technology, I view it as very complementary to all the good work that's going on uh, in the battery space. So uh, glad to be here, looking forward to the panel. All right, this does not have to go in any order, but again, through this lens of, uh, I, I want you guys to explain what you're excited about you know, like all roads eventually lead to education because we're all going to look for those innovators, the, the talent pipeline. In your industry, or even maybe specifically in your work, what are you most excited about and want to give our students this insider information on the opportunities that you're seeing? Chris, you've been looked at as going first. Literally everybody's looked to the left and you were last. I would hope the optimism of youth uh, can definitely attach itself to an industry that is changing on a daily basis. Um, you know, we've seen 
in the past two and a half years since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, a massive uh, swell in both investment as well as employment in the battery industry, um, as well as a, a continuing uh, creative destruction um, in seeing you know, some, some technologies rise and fall, as well as um, you know, additional capital being deployed here in our state and around the country. Um, it, it's exciting to be on the ground floor of something, and I think that today's high school students really have the opportunity, not that there hasn't been a ton of groundwork laid over the past you know, 40 plus years with what Indiana did with EV1, as Dave mentioned earlier, but um, this is really kind of square one for, uh, for the next iteration of the electrified economy, and there's just a ton of opportunity there. I would hope that our students uh, want to seize that opportunity and want to be a part of something that, uh, that is continuing to change and evolve. Quick question, what's stopping people to knowing about some of these opportunities? I'm sure you've probably got better statistics, Don, than I do, but um, you know, a lot of people uh, go into industries that they're familiar with. Mom and dad work there, family members work different places. Um, that's probably not gonna be the case in the battery industry um, because we, you know, we've had a, an employment base here in Indiana, but it's not been, you know, five, 10 percent, like, you know, saying I, I went to go work at a, a standard OEM uh, auto manufacturing plant. So I would say just that introduction piece um, is probably the, the biggest limiting factor to getting kids uh, interested because opportunity is interesting, but not knowing anything is a strange place for, uh, for kids to be. And I think even this Gen Z probably sees a little bit more. They're a little bit more cautious. Um, so having that introduction, having that warm welcome into there is an opportunity here for you. I don't know what it looks like, and I certainly don't know what it's going to look like in five years, but if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to adapt, uh, this is going to be a great place for you to be. Okay. The rest of the panel, what are you excited about? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of playing off what you said, uh, batteries overall present a unique opportunity in the sense that it's kind of a combination of so many different, you know, industries working together, I would say, and different expertise kind of across STEM and also, you know, people that are working in kind of logistics, right? So. Um, I mean, my background is in, in physics, right? I was a fo focused on really solid state materials, right, and ceramics with, with some thin film experience, right? And I've transitioned into this space where we're doing a lot of work with composites, right? You know, it's all about composites. And then uh, kind of it presents a, a scenario in which we have to kind of think differently, I think, as a nation because we have to be, we're very reliant on supply chain woes, right? So it, it presents unique opportunity in the sense that you really, from start to finish, you, I mean, you have to have innovation across the whole thing if you want to be competitive in a global economy. So just to jump in, I think on the application side, it's so multidisciplinary too. I mean, I have a 12 year old who likes science. Okay, great, so what do you want to do? You can, you know, work on batteries. Okay, well, what does that mean, mom? It means you can go work for Andretti and go to Monaco having right. race cars. It means you can go to space and power satellites. It means, you know, I cover the defense portfolio. What does battery technology and EV mobility mean for the warfighter, right? So when you start to think about how do we actually take this and harness it for economic competitiveness, it's pretty cool, right? So I think that would be the message to say, you know, get in this field, learn in it, and you have so many different applications for it. Can I double down on that? Please. The reason why I like that is that Sorry, I, is the moderator, I have a hard time not interjecting, but I, I like that because like, you were giving an example of something that's already local. Like we, I, I, I'm all for STEM programming, but sometimes the specifics of what's in your own backyard is sometimes like, for those of you not in Indiana, we have this reputation of being humble. There's nothing wrong with that, Midwesterners are like that, but sometimes you have to beat your chest on the opportunities are in your own backyard. So I, I, I love that answer. Indiana for the bold, Don. I just have to put the... <laughs> That's our state motto now, our IEDC. Love it. You know, and, and maybe I'll, I'll jump in here and, you know, I want to thank the IEDC for, you know, providing a grant so that we could apply for, a, you know, a hydrogen hub. <clears throat> and that investment that the IEDC made, you know, directly translate into a significant win for Indiana and for the Midwest. And it's going to create, you know, thousands of jobs, clean energy jobs, you know, in the, in the new energy economy. So <clears throat> I'm really excited about the opportunity to receive these federal funds and then putting them into action and really hiring, you know, the next generation of workers for the energy uh, transition. Dan? Yeah, so um, broadly, what am I excited about in the batteries? Is that, yeah. So I think uh, everything. <laughs> batteries are, are very, very, very fun. I, I cut my teeth on batteries about 10 years ago for the first time um, when I was in school and really have never looked back, you know, in talking with 
what, about three years ago, two years, um, a trio of people won the Nobel Prize, right, for inventing the lithium ion battery. And I was just talking to one of them the other day, Stan Winningham, because he started, you know, at Sony back in the 70s, right, in the 60s, and he created the, the, the battery, and he's still the most passionate person about it, and about educating people about how batteries work, and how every time I pick up, like, my iPhone, the, the, the technology that's in that is evolving every day, and every person on the planet has a chance to impact it, right? Like, batteries just are, are, are all throughout everything. You're on your person, they're in your vehicle, they're in your home, um, they're in this microphone, right? That's just what happens. And so I think it's just an endless landscape of, of opportunity, and you just have to be able to give that opportunity to people, and then they can really roll with it. Love that. Yeah. Yes, go just ahead. One, one thing there, right? So as you're saying, right, batteries are really ubiquitous, right? So there's been a huge focus on EV, right? I mean, everybody in this room knows that that's a huge focus, right? But, you know, that, that shouldn't be taken away from, as you were saying, I mean, it's really, they're really in everything. So, you know, you don't just have to have a battery company that creates batteries just for electric vehicles to have a successful company. Right? It's a, a kind of a, a key thing, right? It's something that we personally have been focused on a lot. Um, so, you know, overall, just definitely want to say, I mean, there's, there's opportunity kind of across, across the supply chain here, across, you know, people from many different backgrounds, many different cultures, right, and, you know, our team is, you know, pretty much everybody on our team is new to the battery industry, right, from, from kind of our inception. So, um, you know, we've, we've gone through, you know, the growing pains with respect to kind of training people, and really, so, I w definitely shout out to the BIC, right, part of the reason we've been so successful is because of a place that exists like the BIC, right, you know, where we can come in and they actually give us that real exposure, right, we, we're not doing science for the sake of science, right, we are trying to run a business, right, so if you're trying to develop a technology, right, and this is something I made sure, made sure I was going to say at some point during this panel is that if you're trying to develop a technology and it's not scalable, it's, it's probably a waste of time. And scalability has many different aspects, right? From supply chain, right, to, you know, overall deployment, do you have a customer base? All these things are important to think about, right? And we have a lot of different opportunities here, right? Just not, it's not just EVs, right? They're the huge focus because it's the biggest market, but there are a lot of different other opportunities in this space. Uno reverse card, what's scaring you? What's bothering you? What are your deep concerns? Also, again, any of you, especially on the, again, we're looking future, right? So we've all got excited about certain things. What is a deep concern, especially if you're explaining this to a 17 year old? Can I start there? Go ahead, please. Uh, supply chain, right? Uh, lack of manufacturing uh, capability, right? Um, so the people that have talked to me uh, since I've been here, I'm very opinionated about these things, right? But um, uh, what I've said to multiple people, right, is that this is, batteries are not semiconductor, right? So we don't have a stranglehold for really the whole world on batteries, right? And so we have a, a huge competition, right, uh, from both a, a economic standpoint and, you know, you, you could argue in terms of just kind of our moral compass just of how we approach things, right, in general. Um, with respect to, to batteries overall, right? Because we don't really own the supply chain. We don't manage the, uh, at the largest scale, to manage the, uh, the raw materials necessarily, right? And we also don't have manufacturing capability here, right? So in the US, we're really good on the academic side, right? And we, I mean, we're very smart, right? We've, we put a lot of investment in, in that area. So we understand very well how batteries work, right? But there is a, a lack of understanding uh, and education with respect to manufacturing, which Manufacturing is what's going to make uh, make the world go round, right? So, okay. boy, Donna, I didn't realize you brought your uh, red flag way in front of the bull today, as far as fears go. But um, I, I would say personally, one of my biggest fears is um, the misallocation of capital. Um, I feel like we identified a solution without really thinking through uh, all of the steps to get there. Um, there's been a lot of hand waving on details uh, that. Um, you know, while I'm all for creative destruction, uh, let's not just put a huge trillion dollar pile of capital in a pile and burn it. Um, that's not eco-friendly or capital friendly. Um, as well as falling into the North American or even Western world um, dominant view of, well, we're always the best, so we're competing against each other. Um, China sets the price on everything we're talking about, whether it's a lithium carbonate in your battery, whether it's the battery cell, whether it's the pack, um, you know, we need to be a little bit humble as the West saying we are starting with a, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 year, uh, you know, head start, or we are behind by 10 to 15 years. Not to say we can't catch up, that, that shouldn't be self-doubt, but it should be the humility of realizing that 
China is setting the price on all of this. It is incumbent upon us in this industry to align a value chain to say we need the best possible product to compete with the person who sets the price. And the person who sets the price can torch capital for as long as they want to for political ends as opposed to economic ends. So we shouldn't be looking at each other as, as competition. And I think you know, the Battery Innovation Center has done a great job of bringing people together and uh, you know, the cross-pollination. I mean, who here has worked for two or even three different firms that have all been big clients? Um, you know, putting people into positions to succeed. So I would say our lack of humility in the West and, uh, and our misunderstanding of the problem is, uh, is a pretty big risk. Interesting take. I agree. <laughs> so um, one of the things I'm, I'm concerned about with zero emission vehicles, uh, whether it's battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell, is the premium associated with that versus the gasoline or the diesel counterparts, and, and can, can we absorb that premium? Can we narrow that gap, right? Um, you know, on the hydrogen uh, fuel cell side, you know, for instance, a, a hydrogen fuel cell truck is probably three times as expensive on a CapEx perspective as a traditional diesel, so you're way out of the money on a CapEx perspective, and then on an OpEx perspective, for clean hydrogen, you're, you're 15 $20 a kilogram versus you know, $5 for diesel. So you're way out of the money on a CapEx and an OpEx basis. It's really difficult to convince major you know, trucking companies to convert to a zero emission solution, be it battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell, when the economics are just so, you know, so far out of whack. And, and there are things that we're gonna do. We're gonna scale these up. We're gonna bring the levelized cost of hydrogen down. We're gonna bring the uh, you know, price of a fuel cell truck down. But I am concerned about that, about that gap and, and how we close that gap. That's a good one. Um, these, are, these are all good points. I, I also think about you know, the, the economics quite a bit too, but I'll talk more about uh, charging, right? Charging infrastructure um, as it applies to electric vehicles because that's kind of what the, the hot topic is now, right? So I, I'm based in Southern California, San Diego. There's a million chargers out there. There's a million electric vehicles. You come to places in, in, in the more Midwest, you still have some, but the population is significantly lower. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to posit that a large part of that is like a fear of charging, right? Charging vehicles is a very difficult task and it takes up a lot of infrastructure that is not in place right now. Um, and so while there may be millions of people who want to adopt uh, into the electric vehicles, that price point is definitely a, a hindrance. Um, the charging network needs to be improved a lot. And that's something that America is trying to do with you know, DOE incentives and whatnot, but it's still just not up to snuff, right? When you compare it to filling up uh, uh, ICE for five minutes, you don't, no one wants to stay around for an hour. So that, that's, that's one of the things that keep me up, I guess. And I think coming from the, the, the government side of things, you know, all, all of these ring really true, but it's that the clock is ticking. We feel a very finite moment in time where some of the federal incentives um, are bringing a, a cost parity that wasn't there before to attract some of this industry. So when we think about, you know, Indiana's Economic Development Authority, how do we take that momentum and that window and ensure that we have the ecosystem in place to attract that technology, to pair it with you know, the right capital to make sense, that we have um, the opportunity to, to have our companies take advantage of federal incentives before there's a change in uh, the direction of those policies or if there is a change. So it, it's, and do we have the toolkit and the capacity to do it? I mean, speed to market, right now is actually one of the biggest incentives we can give. It's, it's not the grants, it's not the dollars, it's can we make a decision or a package four weeks faster than our competitor state when it comes to some of these you know, deals that we're doing. So it's, it's just how do, we keep, how do we keep up? How do we keep up with this momentum and influx and, and can we do it in a way that you know, make, is strategic for our state's long-term health? Really quick question, for a uh, follow-up question then, Andrea. So, um, what do you see we're getting right on policies and incentives, and yeah. what is a magic wand, what we're not doing, what would you like to see? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, what we're getting right is, I think we were ahead of the curve, right? So when we talked about these huge geopolitical dynamics, um, we had, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, Infrastructure Act, CHIPS, all of these great federal programs are saying, do this and do this now to, to bring that cost parity, in addition to kind of this drive for, 
clean energy and sustainability, right? So those are the two, the two pieces that were influencing, well, how does the state look at being competitive for those types of grants, competitive for those types of um, companies so that we can lead the charge? And the good news was we had already taken some of those steps. Um, we already have the manufacturing base. I mean, you mentioned that's going to be a, a tricky thing to actually manufacture batteries. Well, it's also manufacturing solar panels and glass and semiconductors, all the things we weren't making here. We have the workforce that can do it. Um, with a little bit of training. So we had that built in and that's a huge asset. And then if you look at kind of the, the federal grants, they're not just, you know, putting dollars for national security and competitiveness, that's part of it, but it's also community investment. So when you look at a program like Ready, um, and for those not familiar, there was two different tranches, five million, five hundred million dollars leveraging matching funds to go towards community investments, right, or infrastructure, or other pieces that have the quality of life. That's actually what's making some of our companies most competitive to get this administration dollar. So we already had that baked in as a way to enhance those competitions. So what we're getting right is we were already there. It wasn't hypothetical, it wasn't done, and we're seeing some of that pay off in the hydrogen hub or the ME Commons hub for semiconductors or our tech hub in bioscience. So I think, again, that, that's what we're getting right. I mean, the magic wand, um, you could probably ask the state legislature for, you know, when we have more tools incentives, it's probably not mine. But I would say, again, it's just, it's the capacity to be able to keep up with this, right? I mean, we have a great table over here at the, the IADC. I mean, we, we can't we can't move these deals forward enough, right? So it, it's how do we um, continue to take advantage? And can I make yes, an addition please. to that too? Um, so I think I'll go piggyback on top of that a little bit. Not only is it how do you keep up, but like America is so far behind other parts of the globe in terms of like if I'm talking strictly about batteries, battery production, manufacturing. That I think in, instead of how do we keep up, it's more like how do you leapfrog? How do, you yeah. step, how do you step ahead to the next one? So like, I think one of the things that American policies maybe could be better at is let's, let's give money for the next generation of batteries, right? Mm -hmm. That we can maybe do faster than, than other, these other countries or, or continents are producing as opposed to trying to like, kind of keep up with them, which, which the policy right now is kind of geared more. So like, really challenge, challenge like, you know, all these, Kevin, or I think it was you said there's a lot of smart minds, right? You know, challenge the smart minds to make the next generation of good things instead of the current generation. And then, as I hear, I'll, like, first of all, Chris, the humility thing has is, is got my mind buzzing. And then, really, in talking about that sense, um, the difference between, you know, like, first of all, I love open competition, it makes everybody better. But where is the Venn diagram of collaboration and competition? If, if there needs to be a bigger sense of humility, then that would I say, like, we should start skewing more on the side of collaboration. But how, how does that work, whether that is a state versus state? of like we do this here in our state, or even on the sense of global humility and working with other countries. And, and this could be two pound in the sky, but do, do you guys have a crack at where like collaboration and competition still can be friends? Please. You guys all keep making me go first here. I just <laughs> I feel like the, go ahead, go ahead. So with respect to humility, right, uh, definitely, right, you know, I think that, um, I just want to address, because this is important. So I think that, I mean, Americans, you know, and American kind of uh, pride, right, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm pretty patriotic overall, right, but there's definitely um, a strong sense that we, we, are, we are better, right, um, in, in, in every way, right, and, and the challenge that that brings with respect to trying to onboard a manufacturing process which we outsourced, right, you know, 30 years ago, which has been kind of, you know, drawn a circle around with respect to kind of the control of the supply chain, all of that. The challenge that that brings is that we've got in our minds that we, we, are, we are the torch bearers with everything. And so in terms of kind of the approach for how you would, you know, kind of maybe go about ensuring that the workforce kind of has, you know, things in mind is instilling a sense of, okay, hey, you know, they're, they're, the competition is good, right, in the sense that, I mean, you know, I, I frankly, I would say that historically, I, maybe I'm more on the side of, okay, I, I like globalization in a general sense. I think that, you know, as an academic, you know, I have an academic background, you know, very much so, it's like open communication, right? Open communication facilitates a lot of different um, benefits, right? But when it comes to national security, right, and then also kind of uh, diminishing workforce equality and all these kind of very challenging issues, right? 
got to be mindful, right, that if, you know, if you're going to kind of offshore manufacturing, right, you're going to have to kind of, there's going to be a bill, a debt to pay eventually, right? And, if, and in this case, right, if you really want to have, you know, U.S.-based manufacturing, right, um, and you want to train your workforce uh, for that end, you have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, so, and I've had conversations with people uh, in local communities where it's like, oh, hey, you know, um, just how do you feel about manufacturing, right? It's like, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, opening manufacturing facilities here in Indiana. It's that, well, it, is it, are you doing it just so you can take it away again? I've been asked that directly, mm. right? And so, you know, you've got to educate the work, workforce, right? There's a lot, of, it's not an easy, I don't have a solution, right? I'm just, uh, you know, kind of addressing that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a sense of, you know, of humility, you know, because like, like Cam was saying, you know, it's, on the academic side, we, we're very good, right? We understand, you know, there's, there's people out there, they understand to the T how batteries function very well. They understand how to optimize things very well, but, you know, we can make a, a, one of the best batteries ever, right? There, I think that James Fleetwood is here somewhere. He, he and I had a conversation a couple years ago. It's like, if we want to make a ray gun from a battery, right? We can, right? Because, you know, we can, we can make a really great battery. It's going to cost a million dollars a battery, though. So, what do you want? If you want to be competitive in a global market, you're, you got to be competitive on a price. Everybody cares about their bottom line, right? You're not going to reinvest all your money into something. It's just going to, I mean, that's just, it's, we're running a business, right? Go ahead. I would just say, I mean, the short answer is, is yes. It's essential that we have kind of global and, and open connections. It's, it's been a huge focus of the IADC, of, the, of this current governor, you know, the last six or seven years. Um, we were just in Mexico City last week on a trade mission, and yes, we talk about nearshoring, but also friendshoring. So when you think about the supply chain in North America to bring uh, that over in certain critical industries like, you know, semiconductors, um, there's a value to that, right? So it's you're right, maybe it's, I can't say this, not always Indiana or not always US, but there is a, a strategy between having partnerships with whether it's geographic neighbors or like-minded neighbors that are able to, to share that technology and that has a, a real national security and, and economic goal. So I think at the global level, it's a hugely important for supply chain. And what we can do as a government, right, because we're not always in the weeds of kind of some of these industry-specific deals, is we can help shape that framework. So we um, were actually the first U.S. state to sign post-Brexit an MOU with the um, government of the United Kingdom. Hugely fruitful. We actually just had a working group session a few weeks ago on AI. We were the first state to do so. That's bringing in their best and their brightest ideas from their policymakers, from their research institutions, to tackle some of these issues together and help organize you know, some of the activity that's going there. We, we know we're not in every piece of it, but, but we can act in that way as a state to convene and partner and find other countries um, that, that would be able to benefit, uh, mutually benefit from that technology. So I think that's the really, you know, global piece and then bringing it down to the state and local level. Um, we're doing the same with our neighbors across the board. I mean, the hydrogen hub wouldn't happen without Michigan and Illinois, right? We, we had a stronger proposal bringing together that economic um, ecosystem here in the Midwest and that's an approach we're taking across the board. And all of that matters to the local communities, right? All of that matters to the 200 plus thousand Hoosiers that are employed because of a foreign direct investment in, in one of these industries in the state of Indiana. That makes those strong, you know, strong communities and families, uh, you know, more economically prosperous, but we have to tell that story of how do you take these huge trends that matter and that it can affect your daily life and that's part of what, you know, our job and my job is. Interesting. Kim, I'm going to look at you on this one because you're, you're a California guy. Um, I, I, I've been listening to a podcast about site selection. And, and, and what all goes into that, and a lot of it goes into what talent pipeline do you have. Clearly, California has had a reputation for a long time of having talent pipeline. Um, not that people from Indiana want to take advice from somebody in California, but <laughs> I was hoping I'd get more laughter out of that. Um, <laughs> darn it. Uh, but if you were in this sector we're talking about, what would you want to see from other states on their dedication towards the talent pipeline? That's a, that's a great question. Um, one thing I've noticed um, in the past like 10 years is there's been an increasing amount of uh, student engagement in the battery field, right, and in the energy storage field. Um, and in places like California, a lot of that stems from the fact in high schools they're starting to put in classes and education systems uh, specifically for energy storage. You know, their kids are starting to learn about how a battery works in high school in a lot of California schools. And for me, you know, you're 16, 
through 18, you know, you're, you're impressionable. Your, your mind is just a sponge. And as you start to collect these ideas that, you know, well, this battery is really cool. It encompasses physics, chemistry, math, um, all the way up the supply chain to doing like policy, right? There's all of those involved and they're all learning about that. Um, part of that in California just could be because some of that education is slightly different, right? And, you know, sometimes more pro progressive than other parts of the country. Um, and so I think it all starts very fundamentally at a, at a young age, right? And so if you can engage younger audiences and younger people with curriculums that are more based on energy storage, they'll be more uh, likely to get into that talent pipeline, right? To go to school for batteries or for energy storage or for, or for STEM in general. And then if you can do that in other states, right? If other states can adopt those curriculums from an education standpoint, then you're inherently kind of breeding like a new generation of like these STEM battery people. Um, and I'm only talking about batteries specifically. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but I think that's a big thing that you can do there. Um, just get, get kids when they're young, because that's when they're gonna be the most interested. No, I, I, and the rest of the panel as well, because I'm, I'm wanting to get that selfish wish, wish list. Because if, if there's emerging sectors, it's, it's our job as, as education people to point them where things are going, skating where the puck is going, right? Um, and so I, for the rest of the panel, what would you like to see from K-12 and, and colleges to get this pipeline more robust? Yeah, so one, one thing I would uh, say is, you know, advertising and, and talking about what we have already in the Midwest, mm -hmm. right? So um, steel, right? Northwest Indiana produces 20 to 25% of the steel in the United States. We don't talk about that very much, but that's an opportunity. We, we have that, we've got tons of jobs up there, an opportunity to decarbonize. We can introduce you know, uh, you know, clean hydrogen into the steel making process. And then suddenly, you know, you're talking about a really cutting edge technology in a legacy you know, uh, industry. So you know, advertising what we have and thinking about how we can use those existing assets and transition, I think it's a really exciting story. And, and you know, getting into the high schools, getting into the trade schools, the community colleges, the universities, and talking about you know, this energy transition and how you can marry <laughs> essentially what we have today with what's gonna be you know, relevant in 20, 30, 40 years uh, down the line. Yeah, I mean, I think at the highest level, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I was in a conversation yesterday um, <clears throat> with a group that apparently is getting some new DOE funding for some more type outreach type activities, trying to get in touch with local, local colleges and high schools and trying to get exposure saying that, hey, you know, there are transferable skills right from the jobs that, you know, your parents were working, right? Coal miners are one example, right? And you mentioned steel industry as well. And leveraging existing infrastructure. I think that overall, uh, and something that we've taken uh, individually as a company as an approach in terms of trying to scale up our manufacturing process is working with existing manufacturing capability here in the United States and existing um, experience, right? So uh, all in all, it's it's a difficult problem, you know. It's kind of the I guess the the problem of our age, right? Is that do what you learn it is what you're learning in school is going to translate into a working job scenario? And I, I, I mean, I went just I went to college for 11 years, right? It's not as long as everyone, right? But uh, you know, uh, in general, I would say that the skill set I I you know gained through that, right? The experience I gained through that. I think all in all, if you have a desire to learn. You know, I think that that's probably the, the biggest thing, right? You know, and for anyone that I would hire personally, right, is that you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to have all the experience in the world. If you are willing to learn and you can participate as a team, right? You know, if you can work as a, a contributing member of a team, it's kind of like you're, the kind of the core skills that, you know, your parents tell you or that you learn in elementary school is like, hey, if you can't play nicely with others, you know, you're, not, you're probably not gonna be successful in life, right? And uh, in this type of situation in which we're trying to have a huge energy transition, you know, coming back to your question, you asked a question before about collaboration, you have to have some internal collaboration. And, uh, you know, for local companies, right, that are smaller companies like us that are, are trying to scale up our capabilities, you know, it's uh, the phrase that somebody said to me is that it's like a, a sea that kind of raises all the ships, right, together, right, rather than if you, if you really try to um, go at it alone, it's gonna be tough, and, you know, and then if you get, you need, couple hundred million dollars and maybe you'll be okay for a little while but if you're not gaining knowledge about how things are really working making sure you have a good product that you can sell 
the collaboration is going to be key for kind of getting you those insights, right? And I think there's a few good examples going on that are, are re reaching into the K through 12 schools here in um, Indiana that employers are doing, actually some of our, our major OEMs are doing. It's helping the kids visualize what does a job in manufacturing look like? So writ large, I think manufacturing can be a challenge to get, you know, I don't know many kindergartners that go, I want to be in manufacturing. So what does that actually mean and what is that connotation? So they're bringing, you know, VR glasses into the classroom to say, hey, it's maybe not what you saw in a movie of what a, a factory assembly line looks like. It's very computer oriented it's it's you know using your thumb in this way like this is what your day could actually look like and getting some of that practical hands-on so it's not just theoretical and I think we've seen huge uh, growth in some of the retention and attraction um, that these employers are seeing in their in their um, regions sometimes very rural communities so I, I think some of that outreach, outreach is happening and then we as a state how can we support that type of technology driven um, learning and excitement I mean, obviously, you know, Cam has the benefit of having uh, beaches and mountains and uh, everything in between in California and Indiana, no matter how much money the legislature gives us, isn't going to be able to buy those things. But values, it turns out, are pretty cheap to inculcate. And I think that that mentality of behind every problem is a solution waiting to be discovered, mm -hmm. that needs to be what Indiana focuses on. That needs to be the message to our K through 12 kids. And also that it's a mission driven or a purpose driven mission that you, know, you can be a part. No one is going to solve climate change by themselves. No one is going to yeah. solve the energy transition by themselves. But you can be a part of a team that does big things. I think we've gotten really good at diagnosing problems or shouting about problems. But we haven't done a great job of actually enabling people to say, I can be a part of that solution, whatever part I can be. But if you inculcate that, there is a solution out there if you're willing to find it. I think that's what we can really do to kind of jumpstart yeah. Uh, you know, the adoption of new industry and the interest in these industries uh, for the workforce we're all going to need here. It's funny you say that. I, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how... Um, also about site selection? What's that? Also about site selection? No, 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 different one. Uh, this was talking about like how rural America, especially um, young men, are trending to be a little bit more patriotic. And, and they were talking about the fact that some of these things, these initiatives are patriotism. You know, we're talking about how in some ways the humility is one thing, but like we're in global competitions and that, that there may be a pathway to a call to help save your country or help your country in some of these areas through some of our, our, our rural students. So I just, I, I wanted to follow up with that because I, I found that really, really intriguing. Um, another tough question though, what are the main challenges facing the battery industry regarding sustainability and environmental impact and what are certain companies doing to take that head on? There, okay. There's some uncomfortable looks on this one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, th this one, I guess I will jump in first. Um, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of what happens off screen doesn't count um, in this business. Um, and I think that is uh, hypocritical at worst, but detrimental to the industry at best. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that we don't actually see what it takes to purify the lithium uh, here in the United States, because we just don't do it. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an environmental impact somewhere else. So to call something, you know, zero tailpipe emissions, that, uh, that's just very disingenuous. That's, that's an accounting trick, not, uh, not an absolute. Um, I, I think on sustainability, you know, we've even seen, I mean, one of the competitors of, of our business, uh, you know, Lifecycle, was trying to... Uh, basically do the Chinese version of refining with American characteristics and found out it can't be done because we have an EPA, because we have work standards, because we have all of these things. Yeah. So we need to stop, uh, I'm not sure if it's humble to try and copy uh, somebody else, but uh, we need to double down on innovation and say that is what the United States does best. That is what the Western world does best. That is what, you know, since the enlightenment, we have done well. Um, why on earth would we try and copy an authoritarian system that we know you couldn't do here because of all of the things that we've said that that doesn't pass mm -hmm. uh, by U.S. standards or by Western standards. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I think being a lot more honest um, with ourselves and with our consumers about just the, the fact that it wasn't tailpipe emissions doesn't mean there wasn't uh, an environmental impact to get to this point. Jump in. I appreciate the directness. 
Because, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that there is a lot of hypocrisy, right, that, that takes place, right, in our industry overall. Um, I question if you really do the analysis. I haven't done it, right? And, you know, so this is probably something you guys think about, right, very directly is that, yeah, from, like, you know, whatever, the, the start to the finish, right? If you are to, you do the mining, you do the refining, right? Are you, are the carbon emissions really less, you know? That's the real question. So, you know, it's like everybody want to talk, wants to talk about how batteries are very green. And I think that um, if done right, it can be, right? Um, and, you know, in, in our, on our end of the process, right, so um, as, I, as I mentioned before, kind of down the value chain, right? So we, we take the raw materials, like, uh, like what uh, they produce, and we incorporate it into the, the battery electrodes, right? And so um, the most expensive portion, right, from a greenhouse perspective and also just a, a money perspective of that manufacturing process of the battery electrode is removing solvents that are in the system. So these solvents that are used are very harmful, right, for the environment. They're harmful for people's health. And so, uh, I mean, I don't know what the regulations are in China, uh, but they're, I suspect, limited in terms of making sure that those don't go out into the environment. Here, obviously, we're not okay with that, right? And so uh, the EPA has some uh, regulations on if you're a large enough producer where you actually have to recover those solvents. And so to one, one point, right, that I can say about what we're, what we're doing, right, in terms of, like, as a company, uh, to address that, uh, you know, in our process, it is, it is more green in that we don't utilize, right, any volatile organic compounds, right, uh, in terms of those solvents that are used, right. So uh, at, at the highest level, I think you, you can't just, it's not just at the beginning of the chain, it's kind of across the whole thing. If you, if you really want to have manufacturing here in the U.S. and you want to do it in a way that is, uh, align with our values and our regulations, right, uh, while simultaneously making sure that you actually don't have, you know, you're trying to influence the carbon footprint, right, there's a lot that has to be done there on the innovation side, as he had said. Um, you have to think carefully about that, and I, I do think that the U.S., we are, we are the ones who can, who can figure it out, and I, I do believe that, and um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we set the precedent. People still look to us for leadership, right, so... So I think overall, I just, you know, uh, you know, I appreciate the industry specific details and we just need a pragmatism towards how we partner with the industry um, to meet different decarbonization goals, but, but in a way that, um, yes, utilizes innovation, but, but again, makes sense as we continue, you know, growth and competitiveness. Um, the state of Indiana has been one of the only states the last two years to participate at COP. So this is the UN Conference of the Parties on Climate. So we were in um, uh, Dubai this past year um, as part of the, the Bloomberg Green Summit. And I think what really came out of that <clears throat> COP at the highest levels is to achieve these really ambitious goals for sustainability and, and climate change, we, we have to work with the steel makers. We have to work with the OEMs. I mean, Neil, you gave the great example about 25% of um, you know, steel being made here in, in Northwest Indiana. The emissions from that area is actually more than the city of London, right? So when you think about outsized impact, that's where it can come from. But there has to be a dialogue and there has to be an array of technologies that we're okay with adapting at even an incremental pace sometimes to be able to do that. So I think as a state, we're trying to hear you know, different perspectives to still do things cleaner and better and faster, but at a way that makes sense with our steel producers, our cement producers in southern Indiana, right? I mean, we have a huge amount of cement. Mm. Mitchell, Indiana, Heidelberg Materials just announced, you know, $500 million in the Department of Energy for carbon capture that might make it one of the first zero um, carbon mm. cement in uh, North America, right? They're doing it in Scandinavia already. So, so I, it's, it's, it's having that discussion and again, adopting whether it's hydrogen or carbon capture to supplement some of this um, across industry, that will actually move the needle. So I think that's our perspective. Um, how are battery companies leveraging data analytics and AI to enhance performance and what kind of impacts are you seeing? Yes. How are battery companies leveraging data analytics and AI? So, yeah, we just had a you know a good good presentation right from Byte Rat. Um, they produce a good you know a good solution right that kind of addresses some of those some of those challenges, um, if not all of them. Uh, it, we every decision that we make we try to do it based off of data data driven decisions right. So. Um, 
as was stated, you know, in that presentation, I mean, the amount of just raw data, I mean, we're, you know, we're a small company with the amount of batteries, right, that we're producing and testing, you know, prototype batteries we're making for customers, for a variety of different tests, and um, the amount of data that we produce just as a, a smaller company, it's, it's frankly a little bit astronomical, right, in terms of just kind of organizing that and really looking like, okay, taking, organizing metadata and ensuring that, you know, you've got price, you know, you're looking at the price, so you're also looking at the performance and you're looking at, okay, the long-term cycling of, of the batteries, right? There's, there's a ton that goes into doing it and doing it well, and I think that overall we're still learning here, but, uh, you know, not just us, uh, uh, America overall, right, is just learning how to utilize that data in the most efficient way. But I do think that um, the companies that kind of crack that code, if you will, um, are going to be the ones that are probably the most successful. So it is, it is of utmost importance to do that and do it well and have a good uh, organization of your, of your data um, overall. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think, also, how many people have ever used chat GPT in this room? <laughs> Everyone has, right? So when I think about AI for batteries, it's super similar. You ask ChatGPT, like, you know, write a letter to my boss because I'm too pissed off to do this right now. <laughs> you, know, you, you ask uh, AI for batteries, you know, get me a warranty for the vehicle, right? Um, I think Penny, I don't know if she's still here, but uh, from, from Bite Rat, the company that's going to partner with BIC, I think that's a very exciting move because what it does is, is it allows the BIC to kind of move ahead uh, in terms of using data-driven data analytics to make smarter decisions in batteries. And you really can't make better batteries without making, you know, you can have 100 minds in a room, but if you can have a computer screen all this data for you, you're gonna make batteries a lot faster. So the AI also ties into like progressing our innovation in America. Um, Andrea, as you were kind of saying, like it kind of speeds it up without us even having to be a part of it, which I think is a really exciting part. Uh, about like the machine learning and AI driven stuff. So yeah, so kudos to Beck for making that big step. I think it's pretty awesome. All right, um, last question for me and then we're gonna open it up to the audience and this is kind of a rapid fire question. Go in what order you want. Um, and this is kind of a catch all. What is the one question you wish people would ask you? What is misunderstood and what are you wanting to clarify that is like, I wish people would ask me this more? whether that's policy, how you guys go about, what you guys do, what is the one question you would like for people to ask more? While we're waiting, you guys can formulate your questions. I'm just gonna go ahead and look around as you guys are thinking about that, and now I'm gonna just look at Chris because I've known him the longest and have him forced to go first. Chris. Thanks, Don. I guess I wish um, that people would ask um, what the biggest risks is the what the biggest risks to the energy transition are. Um, you know, we've talked about supply chain a lot. We've talked about you know China, 65% of the world's lithium, uh, purified lithium, 95% of the rare earth ores. Um, I mean, what we saw with Germany getting cut off of Russian gas uh, at the beginning of the Ukraine war. I believe The Economist published that it was $20 billion worth of natural gas from Russia supported $2 trillion worth of GDP. Um, if we looked at what a, uh, a shutdown of supply of either lithium or rare earth elements out of China would look like to our economy, it'd make $2 trillion look like a rounding error. Um, you know, it's everything from the cell phone in your pocket to the hard drive magnet on your computer to the Tesla to the power tool. I mean, it, it's all of it. Um, and there is, uh, you know, I think we've, we've kind of made this mad rush towards electrification as a solution. I think it's definitely a part of the solution. I think hydrogen's a part of the solution. I think that fossil fuels are gonna continue to be a part of the solution. I know that's probably not the most popular thing in the world, but it's going to take a combination of these things. And when you start looking for silver bullets and realizing, boy, if the firing pin doesn't work, that bear's gonna get me. Um, that's the one thing that I wish people would be a little bit more honest about or a little more circumspect about, saying, you know, what are the big risks here and what kind of redundancies do we have? Because the just-in-time economy worked great until COVID. Yeah. And then we realized, uh-oh, boy, when it doesn't get here just in time, I've got supply chain snafus five layers back. Um, and that's something that I just don't think we're probably as honest with ourselves about as we should be um, as an industry and, and from a national security perspective. Maybe to pick up on that, I guess I wish people would ask me, like, what use cases are the right ones for clean hydrogen? 
versus battery electric versus other technologies. I think, you know, sometimes we do look for that silver bullet and we just think we're, gonna, we're just gonna electrify everything or we're just gonna have hydrogen fuel cells that work for all vehicles, right? Regardless if it's a passenger car or an 18 wheeler or a boat um, or a train. And so I think you have to be really specific about the use case and then apply the proper technology to that, to that use case. I think we need to spend more time thinking about that. The question that I w wish I was asked more, um, and again, being at the BIC has given me uh, the experience to have the understanding to know <clears throat> what is already being done to produce batteries. People just asking simple questions. Do we even know how to manufacture batteries in general? I, I think, and you know, and he's, he's done a good job outlining most, I think all of it really, but it's just that, um, as he had said before, is that things happening, we're okay with things happening behind the scenes, right? Not my backyard. I'm good with it if it's not in my backyard. And that kind of mentality, um, now everything is black box. So we don't know how to, we don't know how to synthesize. We don't know how to even mine it, right? We don't know how to, we don't know how to code it. We don't even know what we don't know. Right. And so I think that, um, you know, other comments here that we're also kind of questioning resource allocation. I, I do share the concern as to whether or not resources have been allocated in the right way such that we could even, because it's like, we, it's the same kind of mentality about the, the transition from ICE, right, to EV. Really, there was no big push. You know, GM, they maybe, I come from a GM family, by the way, but uh, there was a big push, right, going full EV right away. There, there was no discussion about going to hybrid. So kind of that mentality, and it's the analogy I use a lot, is that, you know, it's like, okay, we want to start from what is very established and making it for a long time. We're very good at manufacturing it and jump right to what is perceived as the, you know, the better solution. We wanna go there, we wanna go there now, right? But there are a lot, there's not very many questions asked about, okay, you know, the infrastructure. We all knew that we had to do something about it, but it's kind of a similar thing with respect to just even the core kind of fundamentals. Like, do we even, do we even really understand how things are made? And if we don't understand how they're made, how can we propose a better solution? Mm. I hear a lot about really great technologies and I go to these conferences and uh, I hear a lot about really cool stuff. And that's what it is, it's cool. But I don't know if it's actually scalable. And that concerns me a lot. And so, recapping, if I was, at, you know, the question I wish I was asked more is, can we manufacture in the, sa in the same way that our biggest competitor in the world is actually manufacturing when it comes to batteries right now? And the answer is no. The collective answer is, can we get there? Yeah, okay. we can. Um, I guess, you know, don't ask me this, ask other people, but like, uh, is everyone on the same page, I guess, is, would be my question. So, right, like there's some good things brought up. Um, um, Chris, Neil, you guys just brought up good points about like, what, what should we, you know, what batteries should apply to which thing. Um, you know, I worked at a, a national lab, which is funded by the Department of Energy. I've worked heavily with, in, with academia and with partnerships, and I've worked in the industry a lot. Um, and, you know, the DOE is handing out billions and billions of dollars to do all this funding to, to, to schools. They're handing out billions of dollars to, to industry to make these facilities in America. But, like, like are the expectations of the American policy um, being met by industry? Is industry um, actually collaborating well with academia? So, is all, it's the trillions of dollars going into research at UC Berkeley. Is that going to be useful at all to, like, a company like Tesla? Like, if it's not, you have to change. You have to refocus. Uh, if the DOE is not meeting the good expectations for, like, um, with vehicle mileage or something like that, and the industry is just like, okay, whatever, just give me money, uh, which is oftentimes the case, that's not a good thing. So is everyone on the same page in terms of what needs to happen for, for electrification uh, in the future? I think is a good question. Right. And the question I wish I would get more is, why Indiana? So I know a lot of you know the value proposition, but I'm not sure uh, everyone does, and we'd love to share that story about why it's a great place for battery innovation and manufacturing. Awesome. Um, questions from the audience? Good. Yes, Ben. Personal impact of battery in your lives. Batteries in general, or? I'll, I'm going to take this first. I'm just going to see the cell phone. I think, like, I grew up without a cell phone, right, because I'm, like, a little older. But, like, then the cell phone was introduced and everything changed. 
if, like a classroom is different. The way you like you you can power your home from your cell phone. You can do more advanced calculations on that than you could for a hundred years, right? It's just incredible, and the cell phone is completely charged by lithium-ion battery, which was generated 40 years ago. So, so uh, prior to ESN, I, I worked for Cummins for 10 years, and uh, part of my time there, I was in the mergers and acquisitions, the, the M&A area, and we started looking at zero emission solutions, and there's kind of two in transport, you know, the battery electric or the hydrogen fuel cell. And so I got exposure to battery electric, which then led me to hydrogen fuel cell, which led me, led me to, to, to the Mach 2 hydrogen hub and all that. So, so my life is, is a lot different because of uh, battery electric technology at, at Cummins. I mean, Cam, you, you, took, the, you took the good one there, I yeah. guess, right, right up front. Um, I mean, yeah, personal perspective, I would say it's, you know, similar to, to Cam's, you know, career-wise, I mean, most people with my background, right, end up working in semiconductor uh, or, you know, for Intel, um, or, or similar, and um, you know, coming into the battery space overall, I mean, it's afforded me with very, some very unique opportunities, and I mean, as, as is mentioned here, I mean, it's really working on the, the cutting edge in so many ways, right, from manufacturing, right, to R&D, right, which we do, you know, we do both, and, and so, I mean, I, I guess overall, it's, it's helped me grow as an individual, that's the, you know, you know, at the highest level, right, but no, but in, in all seriousness, right, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's afforded me just the push for batteries and electrification here in the U.S. overall has afforded me some inc ex exceedingly unique opportunities, right, career-wise. Uh, this might sound a little strange, but uh, I would say the dispelling of darkness. I mean, you read any ancient text, uh, you know, whether it's Plato or the Bible, and it talks about light and darkness. And in my lifetime, because of batteries, there has never been a time when I wasn't able to push a button to dispel that darkness. And I, I think that we, that really does kind of separate us from all that came before because, boy, when it was dark and the only answer was, was starting a fire, yeah. uh, good luck if, uh, if you don't know where you're starting from. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that really has kind of pushed us into a level of modernity that is different than, uh, than any of the generations that have come before us. Um agree with all of that. I think as a, a motorsports fan, as we enter May, I went to my first Formula E race in London last year. I didn't miss the engine sound. I loved it. It was fantastic. I'm sold. I'm there. We'll be traveling to see them. So, Yes. So I think one of the things we've talked about today is education. And Indiana does a really good job, both K through 12 and college, in modernizing our education for manufacturing, for technology, et cetera. My question to you guys is, how do we keep the brain trust in Indiana? What do we need to do to change the, the drain to the coast and keep them here locally? Sure. Well, I can jump. I'm actually, I am a testament to this. So I, my husband and I moved here in 2017 from Washington, D.C. So I, I came back to the, the Midwest. And I think, you know, we've touched on it before. It's, it's that narrative of um, the quality of life, the cost of living, and that the innovation is happening here. It's, it's not a distant, all the things we talked about today are happening here in Indiana, the types of jobs, the types of experiences, and I think it's, it's how do we tell that story, and then, you know, not to sound like a broken record, I talked about the Ready program, we're putting money into communities, and that's not just Indianapolis, that's not just Fort Wayne, or, you know, other places, it's across the state from tip to tip to say, like, we understand that people want a great place to live in addition to a great career path, so I think all of that is going to hopefully pay dividends, maybe not in two months or three months, but, you know, in the next three, five, ten years, um, and we're going we're gonna to see that growth um, continue. Yeah, I can't. I, I got to jump in on that one. Thank you, Grant, for that question. You clearly got my $20 tip. Um, I'm dying up here. Like, no? Darn it. Uh, what we're trying to do is, ironically, get students out of the state, get them to build a network and bring them back. We have a, our top 10 competitors, our top 10 teams. We This year, we're going to Washington, D.C., build a network, come back home where all your support is. And I know that uh, we have a really strange statistic, but uh, in Indiana, um, more people live closer to their mother than in any other state which you can laugh at all you want, but as a parent of three, um, I love that fact. And actually in COVID, it got better. More people wanted to be back to close to mom and dad since the pandemic. And I think that we're really welcoming and we want to have our best students stay in Indiana. Shameless plug for Indiana. Anybody else? Uh, 
I, I would say, um, you know, as kind of Dave alluded to again, the, the battery bloodline of Indiana, um, you can't swing a dead cat at a battery conference without finding somebody who worked for Interdell, EV1, or, mm. you know, any of those, even the failures. And, and Indiana does a, doesn't do the best job of um, being willing to fail. But out of those failures, we have built, you know, people like Bob Gallion, who's probably responsible for the deployment of more lithium ion batteries than anyone else on earth. Um, you know, we've, we've created the BIC, which I, I really wish the BIC would probably tell their story a lot louder. I think that um, mm -hmm. from a national and international perspective and industry perspective, I mean, the work that's been done over the past 10 years by this organization and the, and the individuals who have led it has been absolutely incredible. Um, we, we probably need to have a back home again in Indiana for the battery business um, mm. where we bring those people back. You know, uh, 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 Michael Canada was running a, a battery startup in uh, Arizona. You know, we've, we've got all of these people who have an Indiana connection and being able to bring them back and say, you know, we might have failed in the 1980s or 1990s with EV1, but we learned a lot. And if you've got gray hair in the battery business and you've been here more than three years, that probably puts you on the upper 50th percentile of experience in this industry. And a lot of that experience was hard fought right here in Indiana. And I think we need to acknowledge the failures, but acknowledge the growth that came out of those and, and tell everybody to come back. I mean, say, hey, you know, we are a state that is top five in pretty much every economic development, you know, um, Andrea would have the actual statistics, but you know, we, we pride ourselves on a place that is uh, a great place to do business, a low cost place to do business, and has world class universities. Mm. Let's come on back and say, hey guys, you know, you've been here before, Let's try this again. That's actually all the time we have for questions. I know that they're going to stick around. If you guys have any questions, you can uh, meet with them after. Oh, do we want to stick in one more? Okay. If you guys want to speak to them afterwards, I'm sure they'll stick around. But thank you guys so much for a very heartfelt and honest panel. If you guys give us hands for our, our panelists. Okay, I'm going to finish with um, an even faster 20-year history, okay? So 20 years ago, a guy named Mitch Daniels was elected governor, and one of the first things that he did in changing the trajectory of Indiana in so many different ways was establish the IEDC. Um, the IEDC has not just been a strong partner because Andrea was up here on a panel. Um, they've been a partner because they end up being the conduit through which a lot of resources flow. And John Thompson was with us earlier. I was going to call him out and have you give him a round of applause. We're not going to do that. Um, but I just want you to know that everything that you've seen today is on purpose. It didn't, didn't just happen. Um, there wasn't just uh, one good idea. It's, it's actually a suite of great ideas that the state continues to execute on. So uh, one last thing for the team. If you are, I know we had current members, but if you are or were a member of the BIC, please stand up. Give a quick round of applause. Please stand. I know you've been sitting for a while. Come on, stand up. And everybody sit down except for someone named Tyson Craig. Tyson? Okay. So Tyson deserves special recognition. He's been at the BIC for 10 plus years. So Tyson Craig, thank you very much. He, he survived my leadership and Ben's leadership and he's enduring Les's leadership now. So Tyson, here's the 10 more. Thank you very much. Okay. For everybody, just... Thanks for uh, sticking around. Enjoy yourself. Uh, I think we have a few more desserts out there unless John Thompson cleaned them out on the way out the door. So thank you all for coming again. Appreciate it.